The windswept coastline of Northwest Scotland today is a seemingly barren place. Sandstone cliffs dip gently into the sea, encrusted by seaweed and lichens. There isn't an animal in sight. But if you pick among the boulders and clear that seaweed from the rock surfaces, there is a miraculous microscopic ecosystem frozen in time inside the rocks. These fossils are easy to miss. They were tiny organisms, a once thriving microbial ecosystem of prokaryotic bacteria and eukaryotic algae living together in minuscule harmony. And among them, there even seem to be mysterious collections of cells that look like they could be multicellular, like simple animals. The preservation of this ecosystem is remarkable enough in itself, but the real marvel comes with the realization that these rocks are almost a billion years old. And this goes against much of what we think we know about the evolution of animals and our definition of geologic time. Because the eon we're in today, the Phanerozoic, literally means visible life. And its beginning is marked by the moment that animals seem to arrive on the scene around 539 million years ago in the Cambrian explosion. So what are animal-like fossils doing in rocks that are almost twice that old? And what does that mean for our understanding of their evolution and geologic time itself? Turns out there might have actually been a long, slow-burning fuse that ultimately ignited the Cambrian explosion. The mystery of animal ancestry really began in 1859, when Charles Darwin published his theory of evolution by natural selection. He hypothesized that organisms gradually adapt and transform in response to changes in the environment. And that evolution is the result of incremental changes to existing forms. While this nicely explained the variety of living organisms across the world, as well as parts of the fossil record, the very early fossil record didn't play nicely with natural selection. Because, as far as scientists could tell, animal life appeared quite suddenly, explosively even, near the beginning of the Cambrian period. Now, scientists define animals as multicellular, eukaryotic organisms with cells that don't have rigid cell walls, and which, for the most part, eat instead of producing their own food. We find their fossils all through the Phanerozoic, from skeletons of dinosaurs to the shells of ancient sea creatures and everything in between. But at the time, there were no animal fossils in the rocks from periods before the Cambrian, and no evidence of what animals could have evolved from. It was a dilemma for Darwin and has been a preoccupation for paleontologists ever since. But over the last 150 years, we've found some clues from that seemingly dark period before the Phanerozoic. See, in 1946, a prospector called Reginald Sprigg found curious jellyfish-like impressions in rocks in the Ediacaran Hills of Australia. And while there wasn't much interest in them at the time, that changed in the early 1950s when schoolchildren in England uncovered intricate leaf-like fossils in the rocks of an abandoned quarry. These fossils predated the Cambrian and were the first in a series of discoveries that defined a brand new collection of multicellular organisms known as the Ediacaran biota. Today, macroscopic Ediacaran organisms, that is the ones that can be seen with the naked eye, are known from all over the world, including Namibia, Russia, China, Brazil, and Canada. Whether they're actually ancestors of the animals we have today is open for debate, because they don't seem to share many of the features that define modern animals. But their size and complexity does extend the fossil record of multicellularity back to the Precambrian. However, Ediacarans only take us so far. The oldest of these fossils dates back to 574 million years ago, a mere 35 million years before the Cambrian explosion. Much of the Precambrian is still resoundingly empty of multicellular macrofossils. But long before those macroscopic Ediacaran organisms were discovered, scientists in Scotland were finding microscopic traces of Precambrian life that were much older. Lots of life on Earth today is microscopic, and under the right conditions, microscopic life can also be preserved in the rocks. In the early 1900s, geologists were mapping the rocks of the Torridon Formation in northwest Scotland to understand their age and the environments they formed in. And while using hydrofluoric acid to dissolve the siltstones and sandstones, they recovered organic walled microfossils from that ancient time. But they don't look like much, just flattened circles and oblongs of carbon. 
but they turned out to be one billion years old. They were a window into Precambrian life and an insight into the microscopic life that reigned before the Ediacaran. But they were too simple and too ravaged by time to shed any light on the origin of animals or resolve Darwin's dilemma. Many more organic walled microfossils have been found in Precambrian rocks around the world since then, but they are still simple, single cells. The Precambrian record consists of these, then a few weird Ediacaran experiments, and then suddenly all the animals. And those ragged Scottish microfossils were just bad examples of an underwhelming fossil record, consigned to a footnote and all but forgotten. But in the late 1990s, scientists began to realize that certain minerals and certain types of clay can form so quickly that they can preserve incredibly fine-scale fossil structures. So paleontologists started looking for these kinds of minerals around the world. And so in the early 2000s, researchers turned their attention back to the rocks of Northwest Scotland, where those minerals had been reported alongside the ragged microfossils a hundred years earlier. And within the rock, researchers found microscopic cellular structures preserved in 3D. These included isolated cells, clusters of up to 20 cells, and other evidence of a dynamic microbial community. But there were also fossils that hinted at something more than just bacteria. Some of the bigger spheres had double-layered walls, or walls marked with a complex pattern. This level of biological embellishment is beyond the abilities of the simple metabolism of a prokaryote, an organism whose cells don't have a nucleus. And so these large fossils are interpreted as being eukaryotes, organisms whose cells do have nuclei, and not as bacteria. They are algae, a more advanced member of the microbial community. One billion years ago, they were relatively new to the scene, having probably evolved at some point in the last few hundred million years. Together, the Scottish fossils point to a diverse and interconnected microbiota, similar to the one that you'd find in a modern-day pond. There were simple bacteria, photosynthesizing cyanobacteria, and more advanced eukaryotic algae, with smaller bacteria helping to break down dead cells and recycle them. What's more, there were signs that the little community did inhabit a pond or a lake rather than the ocean. Like mud cracks that suggested the ancient sediments had periodically dried out, but no evidence of salt or other minerals that would form from salt water. This new analysis of the Scottish rocks revealed that microbial ecosystems, including relatively novel eukaryotic cells, were well established in non-marine environments as far back as one billion years ago. It was a huge discovery that pointed to complex life finding its feet in all of Earth's waterways much earlier than paleontologists had thought. But it turns out these rocks had even more to offer. When scientists look more closely at some of those eukaryotes to try to tell the story of algal evolution and diversity, one microfossil in particular had features that didn't match any known alga. It was a spherical mass of cells about 30 microns across. The cells on the inside were pressed together so tightly that they weren't spheres anymore, but had straightish edges. And they were surrounded by an outer shell of longer, sausage-shaped cells. The fossil was named Bicellum brazieri, after the two different types of cells and the scientist who discovered it. Now, the interesting thing about Bicellum is that all the cells are squished together with no gaps between them and no constraints on their shape. That means that unlike plants, algae, and bacteria, they probably didn't have rigid cell walls. Instead, their cells were naked with only cell membranes, like the cells in our bodies. So this fossil was multicellular and had no cell walls. Those are two of the major characteristics of animal life. But it was still very small and simple, so it wasn't like any animal we're familiar with today. Instead, researchers think that it's likely to be one of the very earliest ancestors of animals, the Holozoans. Holozoans are a big group that contains all animals as well as their closest relatives, the steps towards true animal life. Members of the group might not always look like true animals, but their cell structures and behaviors are closer to animals than to any other multicellular group. Some of the simplest holozoans spend most of their life as single cells, but also have a multicellular phase to their life cycle. 
So they're among the simplest creatures to show both multicellularity and cell differentiation. And Bicellum shows all the characteristics expected of a holozoan a billion years ago. If life was beginning to experiment with multicellularity that far back and do it well enough for those new life forms to thrive in lakes as well as oceans, then this could just be the solution to Darwin's dilemma. It provided a long, microscopic fuse to the Cambrian explosion. The idea goes that these early holozoans evolved the ability to be multicellular and to have different cell types. But they stayed microscopic for a few million years while they figured out how to coordinate more than one cell together. In that time, they weathered a few global glaciations before bursting onto the scene with an experiment in being big during the Ediacaran. And while they ultimately didn't work out, that long burning microscopic fuse had given animal ancestors the tools they needed to try again. The next time, they hit on something successful, producing resilient macroscopic multicellular forms that could adapt to different ecological niches. The diversity of this new animal life blew up in the Cambrian explosion. And the rest, as we know from the visible fossil record, is history. So those ancient rocks of Northwest Scotland helped us solve a 150 year old mystery. The evidence of animal precursors in rocks that are a billion years old finally addresses Darwin's dilemma and opens up a whole new field of Precambrian paleontological possibility. While there is more work to be done to understand the microscopic origins of animal life, the Precambrian is no longer the dark, lifeless eon that Darwin once imagined. If you enjoy learning on YouTube, why not get credit for it? With the Study Hall channel, you can start taking college courses right here on YouTube. Whether you're trying to learn new skills, earn college credit, or just prove to yourself that you can do it, Study Hall can help you reach your goals without the financial risk. Pick between common gen ed college courses like Modern World History, Code and Programming, Human Communication, and more on the Study Hall channel. Check out the link in the description or go to gostudyhall.com to learn more. Want to know more about those leaf-like fossils that those school kids in England found? If so, check out our episode, These Fossils Were Supposed to Be Impossible. And thanks to this month's macro eontologists. Jake Hart, Raphael Hassa, Annie and Eric Higgins, John Davidson Ng, Melanie Lamb Carnivale, Addie, Tony Dye, and Juan M. By becoming an Eonite at patreon.com slash eons, you can get fun perks like submitting a trivia question for us to read. Here's one from Janelle Shane. What time of year was the Chicxulub impact? You know, the one that caused the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs? Put your guesses in the comments and stick around after the blooper to get the answer. And as always, thank you for joining me in the Adam Lowe studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more promenades in the Precambrian. And so in the early 2000s, researchers, this funny, funny story about this early 2000s, because I was going to put in in the early 2010s. But then I was like, wait, when people look back, when we work back at the early 1900s, like what technically is early? Like what, what is early? Because I was like thinking just 2000 to 2009 would be early 2000s, but this sure. is like all of 2000s. And it turns out it's usually from 1900 to 1930 is considered early 1900s. If somebody comments on it, then we can hit them with the knowledge. Boom. Yeah, yeah. it's actually, <laughs> we checked this. <laughs> we checked this and now I know, and now I know. Okay, anyways. Ready for that trivia answer? It was the spring in the Northern Hemisphere. Did you get it right? Let us know.